Hello, my name is Olive Hickmott. I'm a forensic learning coach, exploring why some people find learning so challenging. And I'm delighted to have been invited to speak at the International NLP Contex for Business Excellence. My talk today is neurodiversity in the workplace. I feel so strongly about this because I was dyslexic for 50 years and probably ADHD too. And nobody told me about the advantages of learning through mental imagery and how to calm my hyperactive brain. I started my corporate career as a software engineer and finished as a research and development director in a high tech company, which in retrospect was full of highly talented neurodivergent staff. NLP gave me the skills to explore neurodiversity over the last 22 years with the privilege to meet hundreds and thousands of exceptional adults and children and seeing them make remarkable changes when using mental imagery and better understanding their strengths. And I need to mention going back to education, multisensory teaching and learning is a given in education in the UK. But visual learning is not in teacher training. So schools focus very little on visual learners, of which we have thousands these days, and how to get the best out of using their strengths. I would like those of you who don't know about neurodiversity to start a very rewarding journey here. And those who do know, to realize what new coaching skills are available based on recent neuroscience. And I'm going to tell you some stories as we go through based on my experience in the last 30 years. I invite you to ask questions in the chat box. I'll be pleased to answer them. I will be giving you some questions I should like you to take away and answer for yourself in your own workplace. So why is diversity important? So just to check we're on the same page, just think for a moment about why diversity is important. Is it about your corporate responsibility or is it about making great business decisions? It's different in different countries. Some countries and employers are doing amazing things. Does it incorporate gender, physical disability, ethnicity and a few others. However, I'm not going to talk about this, but rather to say it is a precursor to neurodiversity. We can see throughout the world how people are struggling to get diversity right. Neurodiversity offers great challenges and even better opportunities. So why is neurodiversity important? The relatively recent term neurodiversity was created to describe a new movement towards neurological diversity being accepted and respected. Neurodiversity covers so much diversity and varies from person to person. For example, dyslexia, ADHD, autism, ASD, Tourette's, dyspraxia are all covered and drawing on their strengths and their challenges. Everyone's experience of neurodiversity tends to be different, but there are some common themes. The dictionary says there is a range of difference in individual brain function and behavioral traits regarded as the normal variation in the human population. We live in a neurodiverse population. Neurodivergent people don't need to be cured, they need accommodation and in some cases a variety of help and in many cases be offered skills they missed out in childhood. Everyone is differently abled, so something that started as a disability is spreading as a better understanding of the whole workforce. Let me just say something about statistics. One group of statistics says that 15% of the population are neurodivergent. 
and actually 50% of them don't know that they are. So organisations have a neurodivergent workforce, whether or not they're aware of it. Again, why is neurodiversity important? Is it a social thing about doing the right thing or fitting in with a culture and you've got corporate social responsibility metrics? Or is it to get competitive advantage to make a real difference to your organisation, your employees and the world? And do you have a neurodivergent product? Some companies do, like IKEA, that is a real pattern breaker created by neurodivergent thought. And what are the benefits of neurodivergent strengths? As I go through this list, I really would like you to notice which of these strengths do you need in your business? This is an alternative approach to assessing talent. Which strengths apply to your employees? The ability to see things from different perspectives and give fresh perspectives. People can not only imagine what physical objects look like from different perspectives, including cross sections, but they can also see without any difficulty the other side of an argument, a business opportunity others don't see. The list is endless. Seeing the bigger picture. Needing to understand the bigger picture and the reasons why. Searching out a rationale behind an instruction. Needing to identify that it has an authentic purpose or will work to change it. Ask big questions. Life's larger questions, challenging questions and questions about how things work. Spatial awareness can turn 2D objects into 3D images. For example, when looking at an ordnance survey map, which is flat in 2D, they notice the contour lines and can create in seconds 3D pictures of the mountains and hills in their mind's eye. Problem solving and hyperfocus, ability to make high speed connections between a multitude of different facts, noticing patterns, an invaluable skill for any type of research. This leads to unique insights, but may sometimes lose the audience. They thrive on solving problems and puzzles, give them an interesting problem to solve, and they won't be able to drop it until they have found the solution. Hyperfocus can be an incredible asset when kept under control and focused on something productive. Drive and energy for those things they are passionate about, coupled with problem solving skills, loving puzzles and hyper focus. This makes a powerful combination. When bored, completing a task may seem like torture. Picture thinking, an exceptional visual memory for things that they have seen before and can imagine, and a mind's eye that can run anything as a high speed video. Understanding pictures more than words and drawing in advance of their age and their physical art may initially disappoint them as their mental images are better. Exceptional per interpersonal skills. For some, their creative verbal communications with rich and advanced vocabulary often makes up for their lack of written communications. For example, compassion, a tremendous power to connect with other people, intuition, they can guide themselves by just knowing, and a sense of humour. Creativity, imagination and ideas generation. Look back in history, many famous people were labelled with learning difficulties and thrown out of school. In fact, most of the inventions over the last 150 years have been made by these people. Creativity is their forte. Today, we have Jamie Oliver, Richard Branson, for example. I have never met people who aren't exceptionally creative, imaginative and full of ideas. Clarity, saying exactly how it is, even if the other person doesn't like it. Takes things very literally, always tells the truth and needs to understand the reason why. Radically authentic. 
resilience to overcome the challenges experienced with a conventional learning environment. Some will develop a high level of resilience that allows them to focus on their strengths and excellence. An exceptional memory. Over long periods of time with the ability to collect, analyze and connect very diverse facts. I can go on with pattern recognition with a strong sense of feeling injustice, with an amazing memory, with great mathematics skills, attention to detail, absorbing facts and exceptional memory, loyalty and honesty, and total truthfulness. Some of these benefits include diversity of all kinds that contribute to creativity, innovation and competitiveness. The greater the diversity of your staff, the more unique ideas and perspectives you'll be able to bring to any given problem, and that includes neurodiversity. My driver is that the world has enough really tricky problems to deal with. We need every possible skill to contribute. We have the pandemic, we have climate change, we have pollution problems, we have forest fires. Neurodiversity is a huge challenge and offers immense opportunities. Of course, there is a downside to everything, but you have and can get skills to help you manage that. There are all sorts of companies and services springing up to help you with that shift. This is where I get really excited talking about strengths, but the neurodivergent population remains an untapped talent pool. The typical report card would say, could do better. For example, I've seen statistics that say 81% of employees feel that they could be better supported. That's a terrible number. 64% of employers still admit to having little or no understanding of neurodiversity. But on the other side, there are pioneering employers. Do you want to be one of those? Initially, they started with ASD and autism and have moved on to dyspraxia, dyslexia and ADHD. There is companies like SAP who've been running, who have a longest running program for of four years. There is Hewlett Packard Enterprise. There's Microsoft. There is EY. There are many other employers. People like Dell Technologies, Deloitte, IBM, Chase. I haven't seen much reference yet about small businesses or even about education which is another employer. Companies like GCHQ, EY and Facebook have positively encouraged dyslexics. But the EU has identified that by 2020, we have a shortage of 800,000 IT workers. So where do all these strengths come from? People are different, but they do have traits. These strengths are all ideal that you would want to build a great team. Companies have identified niches like analytics, robotics and specialist areas, but now they're spreading into other areas as well. All the traits have a positive and a negative, like confidence. You might say confidence is a really good thing, but to be overconfident may be a bit of a problem. The common themes I see all the time are exceptional internal sensory skills and in particular being good at picturing things and memory using exceptional mental imagery, which is my particular focus in life. There's also auditory recall and there is emotional intelligence. So those are the internal sensory skills. And then there are people who are highly sensitive to the external world and may be very empathetic but don't want to pick up everybody else's stuff. To give you an example of one person 
I worked with has the most extraordinary mental imagery. He can see pictures like a newsreel. So when he looks up, he sees a whole row of pictures. And I asked him how he selected the ones that he wanted to focus on. He said, well, that's easy, actually. I just focus on one picture and it comes up, it gets bigger and it comes up in brightly colored pictures so that I can actually focus on it. These are extraordinary mental imagery skills and thousands of neurodivergent people have different versions of them. I'd like to introduce you some, to something that was written in the Harvard Business Review. People are like puzzle pieces, irregularly shaped. Historically, companies have asked employees to trim away their irregularities because it's easier to fit people together if they are perfect rectangles. But this requires employees to leave their differences at home. Differences firms need in order to innovate. This suggests that companies must embrace an alternative philosophy, one that calls on managers to do the hard work of fitting irregular puzzle pieces together, to treat people not as containers, fungible, which means mutually interchangeable human resources, but as unique individual assets. The work of managers will be harder, but the payoffs for companies will be considerable. Access to more of their employees' talents, along with diverse perspectives that may help them compete more effectively. Innovation is most likely to come from parts of us that we don't all share. So I'd like to introduce you to this chart, which I have created because of the range of learning differences I work with. And please note, I call them learning differences. I don't call them learning difficulties. There is a whole area of unrecognized mental imagery symptoms. For example, dyslexics have not progressed from phonics to develop the skill to picture words needed for word recognition. Dyscalculics have not developed the skill to picture numbers, which is essential for mental arithmetic. Those with ADHD have mental images that run at high speed sequence, causing severe distractions, more like news, the newsreels I mentioned earlier. Those on the autistic spectrum can withdraw as they seem to be drowning in mental images without any control. Now, here's the thing. People often talk about stress with learning differences. I think it's the other way around. Stress causes so much confusion for creative children and adults who are trying their best. Despite the differences in diagnosis, the barriers can be very common. For this presentation, I put together this chart. There is much to do. And how do you fit all the elements together? This can be a massive whole company change program. And this is not an exhaustive list. So there's loads of things that land in the human resources department. That's the pink ones on the right. Hiring, advertising, assessment centers, rights protected under any Equalities Act, employers' duty to make workplace adjustments, the UK government supports employees financially by access to work, for helping people stay in work and to get people into work. Then there is disclosure, which can be a nightmare with shame, stigma, feeling stupid, cultural differences and dishonor. And then there is training people up to do assessments to find the dyslexics that you already have in your organization. Then there's the developing the managers and the other and their other colleagues. That's the blue ones in the middle, including dealing with sticky situations when people are authentically honest, sensory overload, stress, perfectionists, and handling disappointments. And then on the left, the red ones, is employee understanding. This is my expertise. So now I'm going to concentrate here. 
And there is four, four main elements I consider. One is how well has somebody survived the education system where there is little money for support? What workplace adjustments can we make now, which includes coaching? Finding what their passion really is and enabling them to do something that progresses them towards that. Let's start with the why. Everyone needs to be brought into this. They all, the whole company has to work together. So they need to know why. Why, the benefits to the business. These are some of the quotes that have been, I've seen, published about the benefits of neurodiversity in the workplace. And I'll just read through them. But whilst I'm reading through them, could you think of what the benefits would be to your business? Managers have been thinking more deeply of leveraging the talents of all employees through greater sensitivity to individual needs. It forces you to know the individual better. It has made me a better manager without a doubt. Broad increase in employee engagement in areas the neurodiversity program touches. Spreading to different areas of the business now. More talk about dyslexia, more adjustments are being made, so we know that's true. And it's easier to hire the tough to fill categories. I could go on with lots and lots of really positive quotes about what companies have achieved, but it's about what you want to achieve in your company. So what employers have actually done? Many employers have actually managed to change processes throughout this system. They've managed to team with social partners for expertise that they lack. For example, say in rehabilitation, they've managed to change to non-traditional, non-interview based assessment and training processes and informal hangouts to help them. Some have set up working with colleges to set up a non-traditional work experience for a neurodivergent population. They've trained workers and colleagues. They've certainly developed their managers. When the managers are aware of how diversity benefits their organization, neurodiversity can be even more effective. These really are the key people for me to train and develop them, the managers. They've set up support ecosystems, which might be little pods of 15 people with a combination of tip, neurotypical and neurodivergent people. Or it may be an ecosystem where they've got a team manager, a team buddy, a job and a life skills coach, normally from one of their social partners, a work mentor, an HR business partner, etc. So putting together what a, an organization that really works for neurodivergent people. And tailoring methods for managing careers. And as I said earlier, this special reference to what is their particular role in life and what they really want to be doing. And then we come on to workplace adjustments. And I'm going to cover that in a moment. But I really want to say it's getting quite well established. We've got Made by Dyslexia in the UK is a very forward looking charity. We've got the Chartered Institute of Personnel Development who have got um, programs out. And we have the UN who consider that neurodiversity in the workplace is an exemplar for responsible management. As I promised, we're coming on to workplace adjustments. Everyone is unique and everyone is different. Workplace adjustments, there is a whole range of them. And let's start with the most obvious. Adjusting the recruitment selection and career progression to reflect a broader definition of talent. Career progression, not just the neurotypical way, 
by changing the workplace to better meet the needs of, and preferences will improve the health and well-being, the happiness and productivity of all employees, neurodivergent or not, everybody. Open plan offices, for example. Some people would prefer to wear sound reducing headphones or have different lighting. That's going to benefit everybody. Eye contact, I hope people are now realising that eye contact is not so important. And for people who do sensory overload, eye contact is really a problem because your face changes every microsecond. And then there's simple IT tools for literacy, for grammar, for numeracy, all sorts of things like that. One of the big issues is to be fitting in into what companies think is a good employee model. And that will revolve around communications. Are they a team player, persuasiveness, eccentricities, and ability to network? These are the sort of things that where we have to start making real live adjustments for people. And beware of what it looks like to the outside world. Um, about a year ago, number 10 Downing Street, which is the UK government home, um, his, their previous advisor, Dom Cummings, wanted to hire an unusual set of people with different skills and backgrounds. Super talented with genuine cognitive diversity. The newspapers build this at recruiting weirdos and misfits. So take care what your external communications looks like. And what type of coaching is available? Some people talk about job coaching, some strategy coaching, some personal coaching. I have coined the phrase workplace empowerment coaching, which is what we do. And let me give you an example here. Working with a very creative company, they had a, an employee who was absolutely fantastic at the creative elements of her job. But as she got better and better at this, they wanted to promote her to more of a team leader role. And she was dyslexic, but hadn't declared it, just made it as a passing joke occasionally. And quite honestly, I think she was terrified of the amount of administration she would have to do as a team leader. And so left the company and has gone off to be a freelancer doing exactly the same work as she was doing before, because that is what she loved. And finally, funding through the government in the UK due to the Equalities Act in 2010 is available through access to work, but it's really, in my opinion, the wrong end of the pipeline. There should be more effort put into the what's going on in schools so my work at Empowering Learning is about workplace empowerment coaching. This is another level. This is not therapy. This is learning new skills, many of which you may have missed in school. This is about helping people to understand and develop their own skills with the benefit of modern research and neuroscience. And I'm always interested in what is going on behind the behavior, not what the behavior is. And we don't want anybody to lose their amazing skills. We just want to make employment easier for them. I've spent 22 years working with people and knowing how to keep their exceptional skills and develop them further to overcome some of their challenges. For example, with dyslexia, there is the lost art of picturing words, which is language dependent. And for a language like English, it's essential to know that you can not only know what the word sounds like, you know what it looks like. And where does this come from? It comes from my experience and that of my clients. NLP gurus who modelled experience, such as Robert Diltz, and thank you very much to him, and neuroscientists who added in their expertise at a later date, and empowering learning is a holistic approach to teaching the skills for literacy, numeracy, concentration, and reducing anxiety. For ADD and ADHD and highly sensitive people, there is another holistic puzzle. 
born out of my experience and that of my clients. And with credit to people like Art Geyser, creator of Energetic NLP, Elaine Aaron, who researched highly sensitive people, Gabor Mata, who is just exceptional and has brought together so many strands of science and psychology, and those who develop the understanding of breathing and sleep. All of these contribute to our holistic offering to help ADD, ADHD people to just make employment easier for ADD, ADHD people. And best of all, if you have coaches working in your business, they can learn all these skills simply and easily. There are seven things you should know. One is eye positions. And to those who've done NLP, they, this won't be any surprise to them. When you're looking up, you're, in, you're seeing your pictures because eyes have got brain cells in them. And so you can actually see people looking up at their pictures. That's why um, autistic people quite often look up rather than look at somebody's face because they're looking at their own pictures. Looking down is for emotions and everything gets worse when you look down. So shift your looking to looking up. Where people have non-phyletic languages like English, you need to be able to visualize words. And mental images are, are located in your occipital lobe, which is at the rear of your brain, just above the dent in the back of your neck. And right next to it is the word form area, which I'm going to explain a little bit now. So this is your brain and the, here are your eyes and this is your neck. And the first thing that happens is when you're very small is you get access to the meaning of a word. You then a bit later on get access to how to pronounce a word and how to articulate whole sentences. Then when you meet words, this part frontal lobe and this talk to each other and break down the word and put it back together again and make an attempt at pronouncing it. Although in the English language that doesn't always work perfectly, but you can get some help to know how to pronounce the word. Once you've seen it two or three times, it should go down into this big blue star here called the word form area, which is where you hold mental images of your words. Simple as that. Once you've seen the word a couple of times, you'll then come on the express pathway straight to your word form area to recognize the word. And when you want to spell a word, you'll ask your word form area to show you what the word looks like. To make sure you keep the word still, grounding and breathing are essential. That keep the images still. And if you have good sleep, it'll be even easier. Reducing your anxiety is a major contributor and to lesser reversals and bad behavior. So that's another area to work on. And you don't want to carry on decoding words as part of literacy forever. You want to be able to just recognize them. And 100% of the dyslexics I have met in 22 years were not reliably visualizing words for word recognition and spelling. That's every single dyslexic I have met, and there have been hundreds. In my example, I didn't learn to visualize words until I was 50 years old. I was furious that nobody had told me and that I'd struggled all the way through school and university, etc., with no idea that this was a skill that other people had. And to me, it's a no brainer. If somebody's not visualizing words, we need to teach them. It's as simple as that. So this is a job role for a workplace empowerment coach. Finding your strengths and your element, a lovely expression christened by the late Sir Ken Robinson about finding your element, the thing that you're really excited about to do and that you want to do. Creating focus when you want. Improving your grounding, breathing and controlling imagery. Teaching dyslexics how to visualize words, the skills others use automatically. 
improving your understanding of your own experiences and you can help people better understand their own experiences where their challenges have been evident throughout their lives. We are not trying to fix people. They are not broken. They don't need fixing. They certainly don't want to be made neurotypical. But I should like everyone to learn more about their own experience as I did 22 years ago, giving them options. Managing their energy, which is very important for highly sensitive people who may be very empathetic and exploring possibilities. And typically we'll do six coaching sessions with people and they will learn new skills. They will try them out. They will practice them and they will see how they get on with them. The lost art of visual learning. This isn't visual teaching. This isn't showing people pictures. This is about them creating their own pictures in their head. Controlling their imagery is essential and all you've got to do is watch people's eyes and you will know whether they've got their imagery under conscious control. Reducing their anxiety and stress and nobody learns or can recall anything when they're stressed and maybe it's just as well that we manage to forget things when they're disasters. Grounding and breathing, which is used a lot in sports trials and competitions and stopping panic attacks and staying focused in class learning how to control those mental images. Then in some cases, we need to help people create their images because they haven't got terribly good images or they don't realize how they can be using their images. So for example, they may remember conversations with people really easily as mental images. When they're reading, they may be able to translate what they're reading into mental images. So that's another really useful skill to improve their memory. When they're doing design work, they'll be able to create mental images of what they want to design. And of course, none of this is developed in school. It's not even mentioned in school. Those people who are highly sensitive are, may have a, so much going on that they may find it difficult to actually sort out mental images and keep them under co conscious control. And if, we, if people are experiencing previous negative experiences, these can be changed. There's lots of complementary therapies for reducing stress and previous negative experiences from NLP and ELP, ENLP. And I have one student currently who is training to be a doctor. He's finding that he can remember an amazing amount of information. He has really strong mental imagery, he, but he didn't realize how he could use that to remember what he was reading. The lost art of picturing words I mentioned earlier, your employee who is diagnosed dyslexic has just missed a developmental skill and there is no reason why they can't learn how to do it. It's another lost art. Do you notice a bit of a pattern here? It's not genetic. Highly visual, creative people tend to run in families too. It's not a disability, a disease or a condition. It's a skill to learn. And when we're little people, we haven't got this skill. So we have to learn how to do it. Some people manage to learn how to do it naturally. Others have to be taught. It reminds me a bit of children who grow up speaking two languages. OK, not everybody grows up speaking two languages, but we don't say that they've got a disability because they're only speaking one language. It's just a skill to learn a second language. And in the UK, it's not in the early years framework that was created in 2008. And the early years framework in the UK, which is quite extensive, makes no mention of visual learning. It was then replaced in 2017 with a much thinner version, which of course didn't mention mental imagery either. And educators are not being taught about the value of mental images and parents don't know about it and children are learning differently to how the curriculum demands they learn. With too much pressure, 
in school to move on. Learning a new skill takes a bit of practice. You need commitment from the employee to regular practice, but something like 10 minutes a day for a start would be quite adequate. Your brain will suddenly go into, oh, this is the way we're doing things now. With practice, any dyslexic can learn visually to spell, read, improve handwriting and do comprehension. There are many techniques for relaxing and calming a hyperactive brain and we also may benefit the ch employee's children. So how can you help? It is everybody's right, I believe, to know about the power of visual learning and be helped to function in a way that works best for their highly visual skills. There are thousands of highly talented children and adults who struggle from no fault of their own. I've been empowering adults and children with these simple skills for 22 years, developing their visual skills to enhance every aspect of their lives. You can do the same and we can offer you worldwide training. Just to round up, there's a mention of my website where you'll find resources and training courses, etc. Empoweringlearning.co.uk during lockdown, I did a lot of videos and put them up as free YouTubes for anybody to see. Do subscribe to my channel. And my blog is olivehickmott.co.uk or you can catch me on Facebook, LinkedIn or Twitter. So thank you very much for joining me. It's been a delight to talk and I'm hoping that we will now um, be able to answer some of your questions. And if I can't answer them now, do get in touch with me later. Thank you.